Okay. Good evening. This is the call, the Wilmette Public Library Board meeting to order on June 15, 2021 at 6.01 p.m. All notices have been uh, posted for the government ordinance. And can we have the roll call, please? Yes. Jan Barshis, uh, sorry, Trustee Barshis here. J Trustee Fishman? Here. Trustee Nealon? Trustee Nealon? She was, she was here. Oh, she's I'm muted. Here, I'm sorry. Oh, here, that's I'm okay. Here. Trustee O'Keefe? She's absent today, night. Okay. Trustee Riddle? Present. And Trustee Summer? Here. And Trustee McDonald? Here. Mm -hmm. And Director Austin, we have uh, Georgia Gebhardt from the League of Women Voters. We also have, wait a minute, I just saw her. Oh, yeah. It's Elizabeth Seeger. And uh, staff here are Marty B., Gail Justman, it, or Patsy, Patsy De Bono, Bono, and John Risco. Okay. At this time, uh, it's a time to have public comments, and I know that Elizabeth Seeger would like to speak. And so at this time, we will turn the floor over to her. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to remind you I'm here tonight as a resident of Wilmette and a patron of the library and not in my capacity as the League of Women Voters observer. Um, this past year has been probably a terrible year for um, Director Austin and the budgeting process I'm sure was very difficult this year especially with, with uh, regards to personnel matters. And I was wondering tonight if when you discuss the budget, um, Director Austin and Trustee Summer, whether you could address, uh, further address four issues, um, in particular dealing with personnel matters. Um, librarian salaries, historically, um, this seems to have been a tricky number to budget because of turnover for senior level people. And I guess with the retirements this past year, it wasn't any different. Um, in the two years prior to COVID, you came in at around 90% of the budgeted amounts. And um, as noted in the overview um, of key changes provided um, to the finance committee, uh, there were retirements of senior staff during this past year. And I was wondering if you could please explain why the library is still budgeting at a much higher level than what was actually spent in fiscal years 2018-19 and 2019-20. And I'm, I guess I'm assuming that most likely uh, there will be hiring replacements at uh, lower salaries than, uh, than you had. So, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding the number. Um, for non-librarian staff in, in the fiscal years prior to COVID, the library was pretty much on target with its budget. Um, and I'm not sure why this year's budget is really much less than the amounts budgeted in those prior years, especially since uh, minimum wage has increased um, has there been a staffing cut or is overtime expected to be much less? Um, I, I was hoping that you could explain that as well. With regard to the custodian staff, I'm sure that um, COVID this past year really impacted the custodial staff. And I'm wondering whether you are hiring a new member for the custodial staff, which is causing the increase, the significant increase. And finally, um, I'd like to ask you to comment on the medical premiums, the employee benefits that you're paying. Um, this year, you are 
after 11 months, basically at budget. You've spent the full year's budget at 11 months. And um, if you in include, you know, this, this uh, May expenditure and carry it forward, you will be almost at $650,000, the amount that you budgeted for next year, which is telling me once again, that either you're not expecting an increase in your premiums or that you're expecting a decrease in your benefits eligible population. And I was wondering if you could expound on that as well. I really appreciate the time that you put into the budget, but since personnel costs are the major um, cost in your budget, uh, I would appreciate getting further explanation on these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seeger. And when we get to the budget, we will be happy to address some of those questions that don't directly involve personnel, since we did meet in a closed meeting to go over that in depth. Okay, are there any other public comments at this time? Okay, you have had a chance to review the minutes from the May 18th, 2021 meeting. There have been some corrections. Are there any additional corrections or changes to, to the minutes at the being none? Can we have a motion to approve the minutes from the May 18th, 2021 meeting? Lisa, I'm sorry. Were the were the corrections already already in? Oh yeah, the corrections are now are the new policy. Okay. One of the things that we've done since we went to the parliamentary procedures uh, procedure workshop and all the trustees did that is the uh, minutes will be coming out about two weeks prior to the meeting and they will have a chance to get all their corrections back within a week so that they can be distributed as corrected. Okay, thanks. Okay, is there a, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I so move to. Okay. Okay. Is okay. There, okay. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Barshis has moved to approve the minutes. Can, can we have a roll call? You certainly can. Uh, I think then the five makes more sense. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I had the list here and I don't know what, where it went. Uh, Can I step in and help? Yes, thanks, Anthony. I don't know where my list went. <laughs> Trustee Barshas. Yes. Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Nealon. Yes. Trustee O'Keefe is absent. Trustee Riddle. Yes. Trustee Summer? Yes. Okay. And Lisa doesn't need to vote. Mm -hmm. Okay. At this point is time for presentations and there are none. And so we're gonna skip to uh, Treasurer Summer for the Treasurer's Report for May. Um, hello. Um, and I'm going to kind of go in accordance with what we learned in our board presentation. I am not going to go over the report in detail. Um, I, it, does anyone have any questions on the, the report or any of the checks written? No. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can go over anything if anybody has any questions. You know, uh, John put together a good explanation of the fluctuations. Um, I guess the only comment that I had that I talked to Anthony about was one of the comments was most of the property taxes had been collected due to, I think the last comment said, uh, the net gain reflects the collection of remaining property taxes. There will be some additional taxes that will come in in uh, June, as well as some of the money, the remaining money from Kenilworth. Okay, does anyone have any questions on any of the documents or the checks that were written? The check detail? Okay. That's it. Would you like to do a motion to approve the bills and salaries? Oh, 
Yes, please. Um, can I'd like to make a motion to approve the bills and salaries for the month of May? Good night, everyone. Thank you. It's been moved by Trustee Summer to move and approve the bills and salaries for May 2021. Can we have a roll call, please? The vote, not the roll call, vote. Uh, Trustee Barshis, have you found it? Do you want no. to? Okay. <laughs> I'm still missing a couple. I, I can do it since I'm not voting. Trustee Barshis? Okay, yes. Uh, trustee, let's do it. Uh, Fishman? Yes. Trustee Nealon? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Summer? Yes. And Trustee O'Keefe is absent. It's been moved and seconded. It's been moved that we accept the bills and salaries for May 2021 by five uh, votes with one absence and one abstention. I'm not abstaining, I'm just not voting. So what would we call that, Anthony? Who knows? Okay, thank you. Okay, now uh, let's switch and do the uh, action items and we transition to action items and so if we can have Trustee Summer on again to go over and Director Austin, and we also have uh, John Risco here to go over the proposed budget for 21-22. Anthony, are you going to mostly present the budget? Sure, I can I can well, share the best. overview on this. So as you know, okay, um, great, the, you. the Finance Committee met in two separate committee meetings um, on May 5th and on June 9th to review um, the draft budget that's before you. Um, the budget um, that was originally presented on May 5th is identical to the one that was reviewed on June 9th, as is the one that is before you this evening. The only substantive change um, is an inclusion in the narrative portion of the documents in your packet. Um, which is reflected in red. There was a discussion at our finance committee meeting um, on June 9th with relation to um, a proposal that came forth from the Village of Wilmette Sesquicentennial Committee um, looking for partnership um, and funding for um, a special project to record stories from our community um, about our residents' experiences um, living in Wilmette. And it was suggested that the library and or historical society or perhaps through some partnerships um, that we may be able to provision some equipment that would allow members of the community to come in and to record those, um, those stories. Um, that, that particular project um, we did discuss on June 9th. Um, it did not meet with favor from the committee. Um, it is not part of the operating budget that you're voting on this evening, trustees. Um, it would be special reserve fund eligible. And if it were something that we did elect to bring forward to the board for review, it would require your approval before we would move forward with something like that. It is not part of the operating budget. So for what it is worth, it is, it is not really included in the budget, but we did include a number of other items that might be a spend for the library within the coming fiscal year. And that was one of the items that we had selected. Another item that was included in that would have been um, the telephone system replacement project, which has been long part of our uh, strategic, um, well, our, our long range capital plan. And um, that is in fact, part of our plan for this coming uh, fiscal year, um, likely to drop sometime in the third and fourth quarter. Uh, so early 2022 for that, also not part of the operating budget that you're reviewing this evening is a special uh, reserve fund project. Um, so those are really the only substantive differences. It is true, we've had a unique year in the past year, fiscal year 2021, um, we did anticipate was going to be a challenging one to project in terms of what our outlay would be. Um, we are behind budget um, by about 10% from where we thought we were going to be. Um, there are a number of bills yet to come in for this month of June, um, so we will get closer to our target, but it is true that a large part of the money that we're leaving on the table this year um, from what we had budgeted relates to um, our personnel spend. Um, we did not anticipate at the beginning of, this, of the pandemic that we were going to see turnover on our staff at quite the rate that we did. Um, that is true. Um, I don't want to get into any detail and discuss any names or any particular strategic direction that we're going here. Um, but what I can say is that um, the average tenure of our team has been long. Um, I would say it has averaged around 20 years for a number of our, our leadership team members. 
And because of that, um, with turnover that happened early in the pandemic, so um, I would say, you know, beginning in July and through September, we saw quite a significant turnover, about 50% of the leadership team turned, turned over. Um, and as a result of that, and with some vacancies going unfilled for an extended period of time, um, that did mean that we didn't spend as much money. Um, so that is really where we're at in terms of the professional lines, the library and salaries, and that is why there's not as much there. It is true that there are a number of vacancies that we intend to fill. Uh, there are quite a few, in fact, that are in our non-professional positions that are going to be posted here uh, this summer. Um, and that is part of the reason why our service model is going to be shifting in July um, and not sooner is because we're still um, we're a little bit lightly staffed at the moment um, and getting prepared for uh, resuming our regular hours in July. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, but um, we do believe um, with the way that we have budgeted this year is a little bit unique. And so we talked about this in committee um, that in past years, um, because the staff has, has typically stayed with us year over year, it's been easy for us to budget. We can tell what the changes are gonna be in the budget and we just add the increases, factor that, um, and then we know what our total is gonna be for the, the coming fiscal year. And that's why we've been so close in our targeting on budgets in years past. Due to the turnover this year though, we had to kind of start over. And so what we've done this time is we've built the personnel budget from the ground up. We have factored in every individual position, every individual that's currently on the staff right now, and factored out what the um, annual salary for those positions would be, factoring in increases and so on. And um, then also looking for the openings that we have and building capacity for the positions that we're going to need going forward. So what we effectively have done with our personnel budgeting this year is we've done a zero budget. We've started from the ground up. We've added all the positions together. We checked that list multiple times. It didn't seem appropriate to me the first time I ran it, but having run it through a number of instruments, it appears correct. And that is why that is what we have proposed for you again this evening. This is the staffing model that we are going to operate under for the next fiscal year. So um, to, to the questions at the top of the hour, I mean, I guess that's kind of my response and I'll, I'll lean on the rest of you if there's anything further that you think is something that we need to add there. With relation to the, uh, the question regarding our insurance premiums for health insurance, um, this is done on an annual basis. So the figures that they kind of split fiscal years and um, we're part of a health consortium. Um, I don't know what our numbers are gonna be come, come December, but what we're estimating right now and what we've proposed um, seems to be on target for where we have been. Um, we do have a couple people coming off and a couple people coming on. So where we budgeted the, the health insurance, I think is a reasonable target for where we think we're going to be at this time come next year. Um, so I, I think everything that we have proposed, we have run through all of our tests and we feel that this is, that this is a reasonable and appropriate budget for the coming fiscal year. Um, Tracy, are there any other uh, line items or anything about the budget that you want to go over? Well, I think the, the probably obviously the biggest one is the salaries. And I think we went over that exhaustively. And I think, uh, the way you explained it was instead of starting with what you had, and just adding a pay raise and went forward, you basically went, okay, here's listed every single employee and did an excellent job in working from the ground up on that. And it's, I think you did a great job. So, and in, um, yeah. And in that analysis, we looked at what the, a, a future or uh, organization chart would look like that that salary is based on. Also, we have to start bringing up meant to the minimum wage and so we another salary salary survey is in the process of being conducted and i think one of the things that this uh pandemic pointed out is that we need to shore up a succession plan with all the staff turnover so all those things have been taken into consideration in terms of adoption of that budget uh, Anthony, I don't know if you want to address Ms. Seeger's question about the, I think it's the custodial staff. Oh, yes. Thank you. The, um, the yeah. increase there that you're seeing, there is a percentage increase that's shown on that line, and that relates to the reclassification of the managerial position that's associated with that department. That position um, was one of the positions that went vacant um, last summer and was filled in the fall. Uh, that is now listed in that category. It historically had not been. So that was more of a, 
I guess, an, an operational detail that we hadn't accounted for previously. So are there any other questions or comments about the draft budget? Do we have a motion? Anybody? So at this time, motion. okay, if you look at ahead, it, we Lisa. approve the working working budget to prepare the tentative B and AO, including the public hearing date. So this is the time that we will approve the budget and those are the next steps after this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm sorry, Tracy. For... Do I um, go ahead and make a motion to approve oh, yeah. uh, the mm -hmm. fiscal budget for 21-22? Yes. As per the draft attached to the minutes of the meeting. Can one second my motion? Oh, second, second your motion. Yeah. Who seconded it? Trish. Okay. Trish. Okay. You want to put the amount in there that we're putting it in there? Include in that motion, please. Yes. Uh, the motion for a, a totaling five million seven hundred and fifteen thousand eight hundred and eighty seven for library operations for the year fiscal year 2021-2022. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded that moved by Trustee Summer and seconded by Trustee Nealon that we approve the 2021 budget for the for the fiscal year for five million seven hundred and fifteen thousand dollars eight hundred and eighty-seven. So are there any is there any other discussion? <clears throat> okay. Given that it's been moved, seconded, can we have a vote, a roll call to approve the motion to approve the twenty one twenty two budget for the five million? Yes. <laughs> okay, seven seven five seven five million seven fifteen eight eight seven. Okay. Trustee Barshus, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Nealon? Yes. Trustee O'Keefe is absent. Tr Trustee Riddle? Yes. And Trustee Summer. Yes. Okay. It's been moved, seconded, and the motion passed. With all those voting, five five votes and one absence from the trustee and the uh, president not voting. Okay, at this point, too much stuff. We are moving to the policy committee met on six seven, and uh, we're looking at policies three and four. And this is the second time that we've uh, mo uh, met to vote on the uh, policies three and four. And there is one change that was not caught based on the uh, one correction to the policy that we will be voting on. And then I will explain the process. On 3-19 library sponsored programs, on page 16, uh, what was recommended uh, by Trustee Nealon was that the uh, we move up uh, on page 17. So it will become the next to the last paragraph and it will now become the second paragraph in that the library schedules programs and events at library facilities offsite and online. This policy governs all programs and events regardless of, of locations. It will now become the second paragraph so that it's right there and it's immediate and it's easy to see. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of the process that we went through, generally first the staff looks at the policies and then they review it and they look at what's working, what's not working and what is actually in practice. Then we look at Illinois statutes, we look at library practices, then it goes to legal and then it comes back to the policy committee. So that is the process that we went through. And so basically, if the policies that we are voting on have been updated, they've been, and as well as the appendices, 
And so if we look at the first policy, it covers library operations. And then the fourth policy, policy four under uh, section four covers the library cards and accounts. So I would like to make a motion. Uh, and so the committee voted to bring it before the board for approval at our last policy meeting. Mm -hmm. So given that approval of the committee after much discussion, I would like to make a motion that we uh, adopt policies three and policies four by public library. Is mm -hmm. there a second? Is there and, a, and the related appendices and the related appendices thank you okay may i ask there... a clarification question please there was one other item that i had in my notes about um the reservation of rooms i remember we discussed this during the meeting um the the reservation of rooms when there may be a tutor um or a tutoring session was that was there supposed to be a correction for that or was that just discussed and i apologize but that was the other note that I had that I didn't see. Yeah, we had a conversation yeah. there, but it doesn't relate to any language added to the policy. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. So can we have a motion to approve follow policies three and four and the related appendices? So moved to approve policies three and four and the related related dependencies. We had moved and approved it. What I meant, oh. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Trustee Barshish, you want me to do it? No, I got it. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay. Trustee Barshish, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trust Trustee Nealon? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Summer? Yes. And Trustee O'Keefe is absent. Okay, it's been moved and passed with six, with five voting yes, one absent, one trustee absent. Okay, thank you. And now we're going to move, and then we, the next policy probably won't be coming up for three to four months because I think Director Austin has his hands full with all the renovation going on and some of the other stuff. So we're now up to discussion items. And so tell us the good news about the reopening, the expansion of the library. Mm -hmm. Sure, happy to do it. Um, so this week marked a change for us um, with the state moving into phase five of the Restore Illinois plan on Friday. Uh, that has been the plan that the library has um, uh, used as its template for a number of our service model changes and modifications as a result of the pandemic. Um, this is the change that essentially um, gave guidance about face masks and social distancing and all matters of sanitation and so on, capacity limits and whatnot. Based upon uh, the state's decision to move into phase five um, with uh, um, all of the metrics um, indicating that we are on the other side of the worst of our pandemic, um, we were able to make some, some changes to our service model. Um, so effective on Monday the 14th, um, we are strongly recommending masks at the library for all ages. Um, however, we are only requiring masks for those who are using the second floor youth services department area. Um, so that includes the staff and children and um, adults that use the second floor youth services department. When they're in that area, our signage has been updated to reflect that they're required in those spaces. However, um, for all intents and purposes, they are optional uh, based upon your vaccination status elsewhere in the library. Um, our on-site programming for the summer um, is all done outdoors and therefore uh, the masking is not required outdoors, um, even though we've got children that are participating in those programs. So that is a little bit of a change from where we thought we were gonna be when we were initially planning this, but um, uh, especially with the heat and the programs that we had this week, we felt that that was also an appropriate approach for us to take. Um, the modeling that we do have on the lawn this, this summer is that we do have circles um, for families and they can reserve their own space out there. 
And um, so for those who do come, there is a bit of social distancing that is implemented at our story times and other programs that we're having on the lawn. So just know that we do have a couple other provisions in place out there, um, even if the masks aren't required. Um, the, um, I guess, you know, uh, those are, the, those are really the key changes. Um, we've been able to restore some furnishings as a result of this. Um, we did send out an email yesterday with, with some updates for the community to be aware of what our guidelines are that are changing. Um, mm -hmm. This does give us, of course, with your approval of um, policy three and the first appendix 3A, um, with the adoption of our new hours, um, we are able to then move forward with our plan to implement our schedule now for um, implementing our, our regular hours and resuming those hours. And we're prepared to do so now on July 5th. So the first Monday after the holiday in July, we'll be, we're, we'll be um, back to our regular schedule of Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., Saturday, 9 to 5, our current hours, and offering Sundays again now from noon to 5, an hour earlier than we were previously. Um, there will be a few service guidelines um, that are going to be uh, services and guidelines that will change as a result of those hours then on July 5th, and I'll give you a brief overview of what we're doing there. Um, we're still asking that folks maintain a six foot social distance from one another. Um, we're adding additional computers, um, but we're not going to add them inside the computer room because that computer room is still pretty tight. So we're spreading out computers around the first floor to improve access, and we'll be studying the, the usage of those. If we're able to expand the, the amount of time that folks can use them, we will do so. Um, but for right now, um, it's one hour sessions, and um, upon reopening in July, it will continue to be. However, with the expanded hours, it may mean that we'll be able to spread out a little bit more with our patrons throughout the day, and we can allow folks to use the computers more frequently. You may recall that we did suspend cash handling um, um, during the pandemic. We're about to resume um, allowing cash again, which means we're gonna start charging for prints and copies again in July. So we'll turn those machines back on. Um, at this time, the study rooms and meeting rooms remain unavailable, those spaces. Um, are currently impacted by, um, well, we've got staff that are performing operations in all of those rooms at this point. Um, we are working to try to, to get those rooms open again as soon as possible. Um, and with these, uh, with obviously with the number of the changes that have taken place, we're gonna be able to start doing that. But we do believe that the study rooms and meeting rooms will be available for the public to book beginning in the fall, at least. Uh, the construction project will certainly have some impacts on that. And I'll talk about construction here in a second. Um, we are replacing a number of furnishings. So there's a lot of additional open table seating that's, that's going out where space is sufficient for social distancing and we will add additional furnishings um, here shortly. Um, our programs, as I mentioned before, are gonna be largely virtual except for the outdoor programs for children that we're doing this summer. Um, we anticipate that the in-person programming will resume this fall. And again, the contingency there is also the auditorium space is affected by the construction project. So we wouldn't be able to book that space again until uh, September when that space is brought back to us. Um, we've resumed the use of our outdoor book return that's at the front door of the library. It's now 24-7. Um, that soft launched uh, a little over a week ago, and um, folks are certainly taking advantage of that now. We're no longer quarantining materials, and that was one of the ways that we could reopen that book drop. So uh, there's no quarantine. Um, we are allowing eating and drinking in the library, except in the youth services department and at computer stations. So that has resumed. Um, we're keeping the toys and interactive materials still unavailable in youth services for right now. Um, uh, we expect to be able to resume those in the fall. And um, the friends are still holding off on, on allowing donations um, as they're not bringing their crew back in to do the sorting until they're ready to open BDU closer to um, the fall when they're going to be doing that. So um, stay tuned. We'll give you more information about when we're, we'll, we'll be officially accepting more material donations. But for right now, they're asking you to hold on to them a little bit longer. The Friends, however, are going to be holding a book sale on the lawn this summer um, as part of the sidewalk sale through um, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, so on Saturday, July 17th, the Friends will hold their first book sale since um, I guess it would have been the fall of 2019. So we're excited for that opportunity. And um, those are the key, the key updates and guidelines regarding our, our changes. Do you all have any questions um, about the library's current service model as we go into July. No, I think it sounds really good. 
Uh, Joan? Anthony, I did have a question. When you mentioned um, additional furnishings, I know that a lot of people like to go and sit and read or peruse. How about periodicals? Will that be opening? And Great question. Those, um, <laughs> yep. those comfortable chairs throughout. You bet. Yep, the periodicals room is certainly one of the, the nicest rooms in the library. Um, we've got a lot of material stored in that space right now, and we're looking to get all those items that are stored in there. A lot of furnishings are in there. We're looking to get those all replaced. Um, today, we began tagging the periodicals collection for the RFID project, which means we are in the home stretch. This is one of the last collections to get tagged. Um, so as soon as that collection is tagged, we feel that we're going to be ready to resume use of, of the periodicals room. I can't give you a firm date about when we're going to do that, but I think it's reasonable to assume that beginning on July 5th, with all these other changes going into place, that the periodicals corridor will, will reopen. At this point, however, the four study rooms that are adjacent to it, unfortunately, are still occupied and we wouldn't be able to turn those over. But the periodicals room, yes, um, we will begin having daily newspapers and access to the periodicals and the, the uh, cozy seating in that space beginning in July. Given uh, Lisa? That, yeah, given that you've gone maskless except for the uh, youth, how long will someone be in the vestibule in terms of enforcing since there's no need to enforce that mass process till they, the mask until you, third floor? I don't, I'm just curious what the thinking is on that. Um, our service model had planned, um, we had initially planned to, uh, to keep our current, um, uh, well, our, our previous guidelines from last week in place through the balance of, of June. Um, so we've got the staff there right now to convey what the expectations are for the second floor. And then beginning in July, the security detail will change and we won't have someone stationed in the vestibule. So it's just for two more weeks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So are you ready to do the director's report? Certainly. Thank you. Unless there, does anyone have any more questions regarding the pandemic and response time? Okay. All right. So um, in addition to the items that are in the packet, and I'm happy to discuss any items that are in my report, um, I wanted to give you an update on some of our projects. So um, the capital uh, repair project is um, still clipping along. We've got our roofing crew, L. Marshall, um, has applied, I believe, all of the coatings. And there's just a few more um, finishing details with flashing. And um, I believe that they've got some uh, punch list items that they're gonna be going through. But for the most part, we are definitely on target for the completion of the roofing project um, with a time schedule that has been set up. So by the end of this month, um, we will be able to demobilize um, the, the roofing crew. And that's when we will be bringing in our electrician to do um, the major part of our project, which is the interior electrical work. And we'll start with the low voltage work. So that includes the security cameras, um, the installation of the access control system and the upgrade of the fire alarm system. Um, all of that is gonna be done during open hours. Um, they're gonna be in all parts of the building um, and they've got their, uh, their measures in place to keep a safe uh, a safe space around them when they're working. Um, they're going to be pulling a lot of cabling, installing a number of uh, a lot of different equipment related to each of those items. Um, there will be a little bit of noise and disruption, probably some drilling when they're going to be putting some things in, um, but they're going to be all around the building and we're going to ask them to, uh, to, to contain the work that they're doing in the more public spaces and the higher interactive spaces to the hours before we open. So we're trying to stage it in a way that's gonna be least disruptive to the public and staff. Um, however, to keep on target with this project and to meet our, our objectives for our August timeline, um, mm -hmm. they're gonna to have to do a lot of this during the, during the open hours of the library. Um, but those are the key projects that are gonna be happening with the low voltage work. And concurrent with that, um, later this month, probably, and maybe actually probably the first week in July is when the roof drain, or the roof drain, the, the floor drain is gonna be installed in the lower level in the 640s. Um, so that project um, relates to the shelving unit that was installed at the bottom of the stairs, kind of on the west side of the library by where the 800s are. Um, that space um, is going to get some of the cookbook collection will be installed in there. So that's what that's what that shelving is, is to keep that popular collection accessible. 
um, then a portion of the collections are going to be inaccessible to the public, but the staff will be able to go there and retrieve materials for patrons if they need them. Um, a few of our shelving units will need to be compressed in order to create an aisle wide enough for uh, the, the plumber to be able to, to do the installation of the drain. Um, and there's a, a fair bit of, uh, of light carpentry that needs to be done when the, uh, the actual shelving comes down, the walls come down, and some remediation is done to um, the actual the foundation and to get wicking material away from the foundation there. So there's a, a fair bit of work that's going to be done, and that will be a little bit more invasive. Thankfully, that portion of the lower level is not frequently occupied by patrons. It's, it's kind of a grab and go type um, of an environment down there. So not a lot of not studying in that space. Those study rooms are currently unavailable anyway. Um, so we think the impact of the public will be relatively marginal um, and we'll be able to retrieve any materials that patrons may need. But that is probably the more impactful portion of it such that it is. Um, but that will finally address uh, that leak that we had in that corner now that we've fixed the tuck pointing and um, uh, the coping stones at the roof and all the other drainage issues around the foundation. Getting it down to the lower level is the final piece of all of this and we're excited to see this part of the project complete. Um, so that's that portion of the capital project. Um, the, the biggest part of the capital project obviously is the closure. And so I wanna give you a bit more information about what we can anticipate come August. So once the library has had an opportunity to um, get the public set straight about what our new um, expanding hours are come July, when all these announcements have been made and we have officially pivoted into our new operating environment, we can begin communicating with the public about the next important detail, which is the fact that the library is gonna be closed for about two weeks um, in August. And here's how that's all gonna run down. So as you know, um, one of the, the, the key elements of our, of our project for the capital repairs this summer is the replacement of the electrical main um, and also the repair of the, of the permeable paver parking lot. It's a lot of peas. Um, so uh, what we're doing is we're, um, we're, we're gonna cluster all those really invasive projects uh, that will affect operation into that same two week time period. Pray that there's no bad weather and that we can get everything completed. Um, ComEd is going to come on site and do an installation of a temporary power line, which will go directly into the lower level and feed the server room. Um, that's gonna happen in probably the, the, the first or second week of August. Um, when that line gets installed, we will be able to cut over our, um, our server environment and our generator services um, to this new temporary power service. And once we have tested all of our systems and we know that they're operational, we will then get the go ahead from ComEd to cut the power to the building, to cut the main. Um, so, once they're able to do that, and I'll give you the timeline for all this here in a second, just give you the narrative first. Once they've done that, um, then the staff will, will not be in the building. The public will, will obviously be not in the building. Um, we'll be providing all of our services remotely, just as we did during the closures for the pandemic. We've got experience with all of that. So we'll continue with virtual programs, virtual account management, virtual customer service. Um, all that will continue just as we had done previously. Um, we also have scheduled this to happen during those final two weeks of August, which are the quietest two months of the year for Wilmette Library, as um, that's the last two weeks before school starts up again, and a lot of folks are on vacation and away from the area. So we know that circulation-wise and door count-wise, it's a relatively quiet period, so we're impacting the least number of folks. Um, what's going to happen then is um, they're going to replace the electrical mains. All of the gear and equipment in the lower level will be completely updated. We'll be replacing and, remo and um, uh, consolidating a number of electrical panels around um, the library. Um, and a lot of improvements and efficiencies will be achieved as a result of all of this work. Um, and we'll also finally be in compliance with code because there will be one point of shutoff for the electrical main um, and that will make sure that we're in compliance with the fire code. Um, so detail, how does this work? Um, it's, it's actually very, very complicated, but I'm so glad that we've got Shales McNutt on, on this project as our construction manager. They're doing a fabulous job of coordination and scheduling for us and have been wonderful advocates um, for the library in coordinating the details with ComEd to get us scheduled um, with, with the library's timeline. So I'm thrilled that we were able to accomplish all those details. So here's what we know. 
Um, our last open day to the public will be Saturday, August 14th. And um, we're gonna run our regular hours, as you know, beginning in July. So Friday, we're gonna be open till 9 p.m. Saturday, we'll be open our regular hours, nine to five. And that'll be our last open day at the library until September 1st. So what happens in the meantime is on Sunday, August 15th, the staff will be in the building. And what we're going to be doing is shutting down everything and preparing the building to be closed for two weeks. Um, we're gonna be doing asset protection. So we'll be shutting down all of our equipment, unplugging everything in the event that there's a surge when the power comes back on. Um, we'll be collecting all of the equipment that we need to work remotely. Um, we'll be checking in all the items that get um, put in the book drop, anything that needs to send out in transit. We're going to spend a whole day um, basically cleaning house, making sure that everything is ready for us to be in an unoccupied building um, for, the, for the following two weeks. Then on Monday the 16th, ComEd will come on site and they will officially cut the power to the building. The only power that will be running then at that time is the temporary service that will be powering the server environment in the lower level, as well as an air conditioning unit to keep that, um, that room cool so that it doesn't overheat. Um, also, the generator is going to be powered as well, and all of our emergency systems will be included in that. But other than that, the building is going to be completely dark, save for whatever um, lighting that uh, the electricians are going to bring in to be able to do the work that they're going to be doing. Um, and then they've got the building. They've got the interior of the building for the next two weeks to be able to complete their project. On, um, on August 30th, they have a hard stop for their work. So they've got, to, they've got to have everything done for us to turn the building over on the 30th. Um, they've, they've been allowed some contingency time, so I don't know what time they're gonna officially be able to cut over to us again, but we know that we can't guarantee to the public that we're gonna be available immediately. So in order for the staff to do the same thing on the back end of the project, essentially begin resuming the mail, all of our deliveries from Amazon, Baker and Taylor, all of our deliveries from Rails, all the holds that are gonna come in, um, basically all of our general operations that happen, um, that's gonna happen on that Tuesday, August 31st. Staff will be back in the building that day. We'll be testing systems, plugging in our equipment, turning everything on, managing all of our assets, making sure that everything is working operationally and preparing to reopen for the public again on Wednesday, September 1st, first thing at 9 a.m. Uh, so that's how that project's gonna go. Now, in the meantime, we got a lot of communications to do about this. So we're gonna do all of our regular channels. Um, we're gonna communicate about this as soon as we can in July, um, beginning with signage. We'll have updates um, via our email um, uh, newsletters. Uh, this information will be in our in print as well. Um, we've got uh, updates, obviously, to our website where we're going to have the most current information for everyone. So I just want to encourage everyone. This will be posted on the front page of the website. We'll be updating the project page as well with other details. But the key elements of this particular aspect of the project will be conveyed separately on the on the main page of the site. Um, We'll have signage on the exterior of the building as well. Um, we've got some A-frame signage that we use to convey the parking lot pickup, as well as what our current masking guidelines had been throughout the, uh, the pandemic. If you've seen these A-frame signs, we're gonna use that same equipment to convey a lot of this information to folks. So if you're driving by, if you haven't seen any of this information, if it somehow missed you um, and you show up on site, um, it'll be clear you know, what's going on. You'll, you'll, you'll know all that information right then and there. And that will point people to the website if they want to get further detail about what's going on. We've notified our neighbors um, that we're going to be doing this as well. Um, a lot of coordination actually about this, this, this particular change needs to happen at the CCS level and talking to our neighboring libraries. Um, patrons who are really active in managing their accounts are going to have a number of options available to them. But one of the options that they won't have is picking Wilmette Library as a pickup location for their hold material um, as we get deeper into August, because um, you can't pick up your material here in a closed building. So we're going to have to do more education to the public about their account management options um, to either suspend their holds, um, which a lot of our patrons do when they're going on vacation. Let's say they're leaving the country, they'll, they'll notify us that they want to just Put a hold or put a, put a hold on their hold um, to wait to receive their items until they're back. Um, we call that a suspend, so they can do that. Um, we'll encourage folks to do that. Um, but we also have notified our neighboring libraries. So if there's an item that you're really waiting for and you want to pick up, you can select Winnetka, Glenview, Evanston, any of our neighbors. 
Um, they're all CCS members and they're more than happy to have you come by and use their physical materials, um, their hold shelves, as well as their computers and other resources inside their library, just as we've done for them when they've been under their construction projects as well. Um, and that's part of our reciprocal agreements. So that's kind of the, uh, um, in a nutshell, the surface level of this, um, of this particular project. Um, a lot of work is being done in our circulation department in terms of getting this coordinated. There's a lot of detail there to make this be seamless on the patron end of things. Um, as far as the staff goes, um, just as we have during the pandemic, we've got a lot of projects for the staff to work on. So um, what the staff is going to be working on primarily during this time frame, um, there's a lot of training. So we're going to continue with training. There's mandatory training. This is a great time for us to coordinate that. Uh, departments can have their meetings. Um, we can have organizational meetings. There's committee projects that we need to get underway. A lot of work to be done in committee uh, to the point of policy. This is a time for us to really get into our policy together. The next policy that we're going to be reviewing is chapter six, which is our collection management policy. And that affects so much of our operations. So we're, we're spending, spending time with staff going over those details during this time frame. A number of staff have special projects that they're going to be working on, so we're working on put, putting together the assignments for those projects. Um, as I mentioned before, there's a number of workshops and training opportunities that we're going to go through. Um, because it is August, there may be some folks that want to take vacation and use some earned benefit time, and we certainly want to encourage that as well and appreciate that. Um, and some folks um, are going to be really impacted by this if they're reliant upon the building to do their work. So a number of those staff are going to flex their time. Um, we're going to need them more on either end of this project uh, for, the, for their work. Yes. Um, Jan, I'm going to mute you one second. Okay, so um, so that's kind of how you know that they can you know work fewer hours during that project and more hours later, and that's how we can make them whole for, for what their regular hours are. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell um, what we're going to do is in terms of our communication plan and our staffing plan for this particular two-week closure. Do you all have any questions about um, this phase of the project? Yeah, Fina, go ahead. Anthony, I you know I was concerned about the book drop at like the Wilmot Community Center, and I think there's one at the at Linden. In case there's a pile up or. I don't know what you have in the interim there. Good, good point, Fina. Yeah. So because we're not going to have a place to store any of our materials, we can't we can't operate our book drops. So the other messaging that we're going to be sending to our patrons is all of your materials are going to be due in September. So you've got and since we don't charge fines, um, just hold on to your material for this time frame and um, and return it when when we're back open again and we can resume uh, receiving that that material. So the book drops, even the remote ones are going to be closed, and especially because they are so small um, and we have nowhere to, to to pick them up and store them for the interim. This is the only option that we've got available to us. And my second question is just out of curiosity, is any staff able to get into the building if they need to, let's say for, you know, an item that they forgot a work item or you, you know, need to get back in for anything? Well, I'm exempt um, and, and I care about the building. So I think um, Marcos, our, our facilities manager and I are the only ones that are going to be approved to come on site. Um, so just as we did during the pandemic, if there was someone that needed something in the building, and we could certainly help them retrieve those things, but that's that's not our plan. We want everyone to get everything that they need at the outset so that we don't have to do that. The building is really not going to be habitable. Um, it's not going to be safe for really anyone besides the construction crew to be inside of it. So um, we will we will check on the site and we're going to go around regularly, uh, Marcos and Ida, to maintain the site and to maintain awareness of the building. Um, but in terms of staff getting inside the building, no, no one's going to be in it. Any other questions about the project? Um, what about the lighting outside and or security lighting? So when you drive by, there usually is some lighting on inside, even on when the doors are closed. Will that generator take care of any the of that? It does, Joan. Yep. So there's a, there is emergency lighting, and that's covered um, as part of this. Um, a good good question about the exterior lighting and the parking lot lighting, and you know the bollards and so on. Um, I'll need to check on that. Um, it if we can, we'll try to add add load to those so that we've got the lighting on the exterior of the building. 
Um, but yeah, if, if that's not possible, and it may not be, because there are a number of things that are contingencies with this, um, then we may, not, we may not have lights on the exterior of the building. Um, and if we need them, then they may need to come from a different generator source. I think just sort of peace of mind that it doesn't look like it's an abandoned building and somebody from another community would say, well, you know, what's going on with the Wilmette Public Library? So it looks like there's some life around, but you'll, you'll check on that. Thank you. Yep. Yep. And we'll, and as I said, we'll make sure that there's adequate signage and communications on the exterior of the building um, in case anyone is wondering what's going on. Um, obviously, we'll have a lot more information to share with you when we launch this plan and we give a bit more detail to the public about the updates and so on. So stay tuned. We've got a lot more information on this one coming your way. All right, and we can come back to that too. Um, but let me let me move on with a couple more project updates. If you've got any more questions on that, just hold on to them for a second. Um, so as I mentioned a moment ago, um, one of our other big um, special reserve projects that's going on right now is our RFID project. Um, so uh, the tagging is, is the most laborious aspect of this whole project, and I'm thrilled to report that our tagging team is in the home stretch. Um, they have largely finished the audiovisual department um, today, um, so we're thrilled about that. That means all the DVDs have been done. The only collection there that remains to be done is the compact disc collection, and as you may know, we're going to be repackaging um, any of the CDs that are in jewel cases. Um, we've got a new system that we're going to use to um, that's more durable and uh, takes up less space, and that's going to be um, implemented here shortly. We, we've just received notice that that equipment is finally going to be arriving. It was uh, apparently on back order, so it's on its way. Um, and as soon as that's here, then we can start repackaging all of our compact discs, getting those tagged and getting them out to the public. Um, the periodicals room began today, and that tagging um, uh, should be done by hopefully, you know, by the end of the month, in which case we'll be able to turn over uh, that room. And um, the tagging project will essentially be completed, save for a couple other smaller collections that really don't affect the public at all, like our reference collection and whatnot. We'll be putting these RFID tags in them for asset purposing. Um, so that project will effectually, uh, effectively be complete, which means that we can then um, begin communications to the public about uh, turning on the RFID system, which means um, when you're going to use our new self-checkout units, instead of having to try to find the library barcode on it instead of the ISBN or any other way of trying to scan, um, you won't have to scan it at all. You just set it down on the bed after you scan your library card, and it will automatically recognize everything that you've set down because that's the beauty of RFID. Um, it will very much simplify the way that checkout and check-in happens for us. Um, and we're really excited to be able to turn on that, that system probably in, in July. So well, definitely, definitely in July, but I mean, I, I can't really tell you what the date is at this point, but we're hoping pretty, pretty hot on the heels of reopening on July 5th, this will be a new feature that we can enable. Obviously, a lot of communications that we need to put together about this aspect as well, but we think people are going to take to it pretty quickly, as a number of our peer libraries in the area already have the system and our patrons um, definitely move around from one place to another and should already be pretty familiar with this equipment and the way it works. So we're thrilled. RFID project is nearing the home stretch and completion. Um, the other big project that we've got going on right now is our website redesign project. Uh, that group met again today. Um, we're in the, the design phase right now where we're, we're making a lot of very detail-oriented decisions about what the future website is going to look like. Um, but what would really help us out is if we could get more feedback from you all and the public. So there is a survey that is being conducted right now. It's on the front page of the website and has been in various emails that we've been sending out this last month. Um, if you haven't already submitted your feedback about how you use the library online, we'd really appreciate it if you would fill out that survey for us as that information is going to help to inform some of the design decisions that we make about this page going forward. Um, once that survey is complete, um, that will, like I said, help us make some decisions there. There will also be opportunity for additional feedback for the board, specifically when we get to um, a test phase for the website where we'll have a focus group for the board to participate, just as much as we'll have them for the public and the staff as well. Um, so 
just because uh, whether you participate in this or not, there will still be a further opportunities for you to provide feedback on the next iteration of the website. Again, that project is slated to launch um, this fall, likely in September. Those are, yeah, Tracy. I have a, just, so when you're doing the website update, update are you also updating the app? Will there um, be some similar changes? Yeah, so the, the app is um, is a different company that manages the app. We will create some aesthetic changes to the to the app that will reflect, um, I think, the the changing aesthetic of the main website. Um, however, the functionality of the app is native to that particular product, so the the app really isn't going to change an awful lot. But yes, it, it will get a, a light refresh. Any other questions about any of the projects that I've mentioned? All right, are there any questions about the content of the director's report? Can you provide us a brief update on uh, the summer reading program? Since I saw the kiosk out yesterday, signing up kids, and it seemed to be quite a lively little place. <laughs> it sure is. Um, now, this is a detail that I, I guess I would have to go to our website to give you a little bit more information about what, what's happening there. So I guess I would direct you to look at the website to learn more about what's going on with our summer reading program. I'm not so prepared to, to give you a full overview of what we've just launched there. But I, I would encourage you to look at the front page of the site to learn more about the participation there. We're following the same model that we have in years past. Um, our, our reading prizes this year, again, are our gift certificates to the book stall at $15. And um, we're, we're just really trying to encourage folks to read. That's the, that's the real incentive behind this. So the, the, the reward is, is more reading. And uh, the reporting, that you're, what Lisa's referring to is the reporting booth that historically has been inside the library. We do have a reporting booth inside the building on the second floor um, in youth services where we always have. However, we're also doing the reporting outdoors um, and we're doing it with the book bike. Um, so that definitely come by and check it out. It's, uh, it's a lively crew. We've got some new staff that are helping us out with this as well this summer. Um, they've got a lot of fun stuff planned. Yeah, Joan. In the past, uh, you've been at the Wilmet Farmer's Market with the book bike as well as summer reading program. Any plans to uh, be there on Saturdays? Uh, I, I don't have a firm answer for you on that. Not immediately. Um, we, we don't really have the resources to do this immediately, but as the summer goes on, yes, we do have a plan to do more of our outreach and that is a destination for us, yes. Um, and that also could be a great way to convey the um, August changes and the August sure. shutdown with a maybe a little handout of some sort and or a sandwich board. Yep, that's always a great way to, to make it connections. It was buzzing last weekend, so it get, it's as more, as the market grows in what they can sell, obviously a lot more people attend. So that might be a great uh, avenue to get the word out. Thank you. And as a board member, I'd be willing to staff a table. Hey, all right. Love maybe it. some other board members. We have had that in the past. So thank I you, Joan. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. You gonna ride the bike, Joan? And that I made decline. <laughs> I'll sit at the table, <laughs> answer questions and uh, walk up and down the market. I would do it with you, Joan, but I, I, I'll, well, let's we'll con converse later and maybe pick a date. I would do it with you. Oh, good, good. Well, Anthony can- if I'm in town. Touch base with marketing okay. team. Yeah. Sounds great. All right, anything else, um, either from the director's report or anything that we've talked about that we want to explore a little bit further? Okay, well, that concludes my report then. Thank you. You're welcome. Trustee Barshish, do you have anything to add for the ILA or Rails update? You might have to unmute her. Can you unmute her? 
Anthony. I got it. Is that it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The ILA is having its major uh, convention in October from the 12th to the 14th. And uh, it's on their website right now. So if you are looking to sign up for something else to do at the end of the summer, uh, take a look at what they have. That's it. And if you all are interested in as as be as part of your being a trustee, uh, we are happy to have you join the ILA. The library will pay for you to join the ILA. And if you wanted to attend the conference, it's virtual. So, and they're not and they're not having because I went online to see exactly what they're not having the uh, independent one. Uh, the independent conference that they used to have for free the day before it, uh, in terms of United. Mm -hmm. But what they are, what they do have and might be of interest is when I went on the website, if you belong to Rails or whatever, if, because you, we belong to Rails, you can attend. They've got three on demand programs one, making the case for your library, creating board and community champions, library budgeting, and governing a crisis. So those are available on demand. So I will send you the link to that. I'll have Anthony send the link and how you all can sign up for that. So that's one option since if you don't want to go to the ALA virtually. Okay. Anthony, Anthony do you have anything else to add regarding Rails or ILA? Not during that, uh, not regarding those items, but I wondered yeah. if we're at the point of the meeting where we want to summarize um, the workshop that we attended um, on Saturday, June 4th. Is that the date? In fifth, yes. you're right. It is. Uh, the fifth. I mentioned yeah. it briefly at the beginning in terms of that everyone was present and that as a result of that, how we have changed the minutes. Also, there's no second required. And mm -hmm. then I think the third thing is in terms of how we are going to be doing the minutes. Would somebody else like to add something else regarding what they got out of that? It was. A... Can I just reiterate what you just said, Lisa? I mean, yes. so because mm -hmm. these are some changes. So for folks who who are frequent observers of the library board meetings, um, it, it's, it, it's a little bit different today um, as a result of, of what we've discussed, right? So um, we're just seeing a motion, we're not seeing seconds. And a lot of this is based off of, um, the, this is an older version, but we're, um, per our bylaws, we're governed by Robert's Rules of Order. And um, we have ordered a copy of this book for everyone on the board as a result of that workshop, and we'll distribute them to each of you so you've got this information in hand. But we've got the Roberts Rules of Order, newly re revised in brief, 12th edition. Um, each of you are going to get your own copy. And um, what we've learned through this workshop that we, uh, that we all attended um, is that we don't need to second our motions. Um, so we've, we've stopped that. Um, and our minutes are going to be a reflection of the action that takes place at the meeting rather than like a verbatim account of what took place in the meetings. Um, in fact, this recording that we're making right now can stand as the verbatim account of what happens at our meetings. And um, are there other things that we've learned that you all want to share based upon that workshop? Yeah, Trish, go ahead. Um, I believe there's going to be more involvement of uh, the committee chairs to if we're having a committee meeting to run the meeting and um, uh, I guess that really helps put the onus on us to present and under understand our material. Um, so I think it's gonna be a really good thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we're gonna be stumbling along for a while, you know. Uh, in the league, we did that too when we ran meetings with uh, um, Robert's Rules. So if you're new to it, somebody will jump in and help you. So as happened in this meeting, so. Um, I would also say that uh, you're, we're not going to go over the, the the materials in detail. Well, it's something that I'm, I'm not sure how it went before, but they say they expect people to have reviewed it before, maybe a quick summary, and then that's it. Joan, did you want to add something? Um, to clarify, the um, we did take a second for financial matters. Well, cool? We don't have to. We don't have to. Okay. We that's, don't have to. That's right. But we did. 
and only, um, okay, that's right. I just wanted to clarify that. And this is all, again, I think, Anthony, as you said, it has nothing to do, this is our understanding of the updated Roberts rules. It has nothing to do with COVID times or anything else like that. I just wanted to clarify that. Yep. No, our objective right. here is to run more <laughs> effective and efficient meetings. Mm -hmm. Jan, did you? Jan, did you have something you wanted to add? No, I thought the workshop was actually really interesting, and uh, I learned quite a bit from it. And I think it's going to be good going forward to make more use of that. So that's all. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We talked about the American Library Association. What I didn't cover were communications and uh, comments. And you all have seen quite a few emails. And the emails that we've gotten have been based on landscaping, the mask mm -hmm. policy, some pro, some against, some against children being masked, and uh, when Sunday hours were going to be initiated. And I know some of you are tempted to respond, but I'm just going to read in terms of Article 3, Section 2, Section 3, Number 2, in terms of the president, and it's the bylaws for the Wilmette Public Library District. And basically what it says is, okay, the president, wait a minute, wait a minute. The president shall be the official voice of the board to the news media and for responding to written comments from patrons. The president may delegate to the director responsibility for responding to written comments from patrons. And so that's how we do it. And some of them, and to him, Anthony has, in one case, he had detailed history of what had happened. So I think he was the best person. And sometimes we have both written responses. Mm -hmm. so but I don't copy everybody on that. So that was just okay. clarification of that based on some of the emails I've received. Okay. <laughs> and then the other thing is the audit, as a requirement of the Illinois Public Library annual report, the board minutes secretary's audit committee is required to review minutes of the WPL mm -hmm. board of trustee meetings for fiscal year 2021 prior to the August 21 board meeting. Trustees O'Keefe and Neelan are on that committee and what they will you, you put before we adopt the June minutes. So anytime after our June, uh, our July meeting, when we adopt the June meeting to the August meeting, check with Marty, make an appointment with Marty. You all don't need to go together. What you're basically mm -hmm. seeing a check in is that they have all the signatures and all the attachments. Okay. Any questions on that one? Mm -hmm. And so we don't have any unfinished business, but in terms of new business, uh, there's going to be a community connections committee by Patricia Nealon, Trustee Nealon, and I'll let her speak on that. Okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, suggest that we have our first uh, meeting of that committee sometime within the next, uh, say, two to four weeks. I know we're really, really busy, but it would just be um, a relatively brief meeting where we kind of define the committee and, you know, brainstorm a little bit. So I'm, I, I know, Jan, you're on that committee with me, and mm -hmm. I think you know, I don't know, Lisa, but I think Jan might be the only other person. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, no, we've got another oh, well, there's... person. Joan's oh. on there. And yep. I'm on there. Oh, yay. Okay. <laughs> we don't have to be by ourselves. <laughs> okay, good, good. That's awesome. So, I show up uh, at all of them most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's great. So, um, so anyway, um, if we could maybe just get out a doodle poll within the next uh, week or so, and then, with, you know, in the coming two, three weeks, like, we can set something up. Um, okay. Yeah. I look forward to that. Okay, that'd so, be great. What would be helpful, Anthony, since the website's coming up? Mm -hmm. If you, if, because you, we had talked and you've done some of the uh, libraries that you feel the trustees' best practices for some of the websites. Do you have that? You had said some are, do you know what I'm talking about? No, I don't. Continue. Okay. <laughs> one of the, okay, one of the things I'd asked you is what libraries have you seen where you like how the trustees are presented, where you feel that? 
in terms wow. of what you're looking for in terms of good models. So if you could just share that with the committee, it might be good for us to look at it prior to that. Perfect. Mm -hmm. With everybody. Yeah, that, is, that is perfect, yeah. Um, great. I know Monica from uh, Winnetka mentioned that she's uh, done a, a uh, trustee, uh, portal. what is the word? Portal, portal, that's it, right. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, that, that sounded good to me. Yeah. And, and we can, I think, you know, like the, um, the trustee manuals that you all have gotten, um, well, our new trustees have gotten, I think we can digitize that information and make it accessible to everyone. That's one, I think that's a lot of the content that Monica has on her portal, um, but there's a number of other resources that we can put together for you as well. So yeah, I definitely Great. want to talk about that with y'all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we forgot the, you forgot to announce the Independence Day because I just sort of ran, did Rambo over it, but the library is closed Sunday, July 4th. They're closed anyway. At that mm -hmm. point, yes. Yeah, it's closed anyway. <laughs> it didn't open on July 5th. Is there anybody else that has some new business that they would like to bring up? Nope. Going once, going twice. Okay. I would move that we the live conclude this meeting at 7.17 p.m. Can we have by, we don't need a roll call, do we? Can we just say all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. This concludes the meeting and enjoy the rest of the evening. Oh, one other thing, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're going to meet starting next month. I know it was been up in the air as to when, whether, when we start at 6 or 6.30, but since it starts a new fiscal year, is that okay? And then I rescind. I can rescind the adjournment, but that was the one thing I forgot <laughs> to mention. I rescind the adjournment. Uh, is 6.30 okay starting next month? Yep. yep. That's the time that we had endorsed in the, um, right. the meeting ordinance. So. We can just officially start at 6.30 then in July. Okay, yeah. just wanted to go over that. Okay, now I move that we close out <laughs> at 7.18. All okay. in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Aye. Aye. Good night. Okay. Good night. Thank okay. you all. Thank you. For real thank you, Anthony. Time. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Bye-bye.